This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today, alongside Bob Pastorella, we're going to be chatting with Jonathan Oliver for part two of the conversation. As with all of these episodes, you can listen in any order, so by all means, go back to part one in which we talk to Jonathan about early life lessons, publishing, reading genre fiction, and a lot more. Or listen to this one first and go back to 322 when you're done. And we get into so much in the second half of the conversation. We talk about Jonathan getting a master's in science fiction, how he got it, where he got it from, why he got it. We answer all of those questions that anyone might possibly have on an MA in SF. Then we talk about his time with Rebellion Publishing, about all those anthologies that he put together. And then moving on from that, we talk about his forthcoming collection and indeed ordering short story collections. And as I mentioned at the start of part one, originally the collection was going to be with Cheezine. This was before everything kicked off over there at the end of last year. As I said in the previous episode, if you want the lowdown on that, then there's an episode that came out in November of the horror show with Brian Keane. That is probably the most comprehensive podcast on the demise of Cheezine, so listen to that. But the good news in terms of Jonathan's collection is that it has been picked up by Black Shuck Books. It will be out later this year, I believe in September, so keep an eye out for it, and it's going to be a good one. Now, Jonathan has recently started offering freelance editing and writing services so that has literally come about in the last week or so so very good timing in terms of this podcast and if you want to work with Jonathan on something if there's something you would like him to edit or you would like to query his rates and what he can offer you then head over to his twitter at John Oliver editor and drop him a line. Okay, well, before I get into the conversation, let us have a quick word from our sponsors. Water for Drowning by Ray Cluley, narrated by R.J. Bailey, is the brand new audiobook from This Is Horror, including the British fantasy award-winning story Shark Shark. Dive in and download Water for Drowning by Ray Cluley on Audible today at bit.ly.com forward slash water for drowning in the US and bit.ly.com forward slash water for drowning UK in the UK. Okay, well, with that said, let us not delay. Here it is. It is part two of the conversation with Jonathan Oliver. Well, before you mentioned your Master of Science Fiction at Reading University, (laughs) and I know that listeners will want me to pick up on that because (laughs) we need to know, I mean, what choices, what things do you do in life that leads you to taking that course? And can you tell us a little bit about I just have amazing parents because after my first degree, I saw, uh, well, during my first degree, which I did at Luton University, pretty sweet, uh, (laughs) (laughs) I saw an advert for this course in science fiction at Reading, and I somehow convinced my parents this was a good thing and that I'd move to Reading and do that and that they'd pay. (laughs) 
So I don't know how I managed to do that. And also how I managed to end up as a science fiction editor. It all seems very lucky. Um, but yeah, it was one year course run by Edward James, who's a buddy of mine. And, uh, you know, well, that's the first time I met him. He used to be my professor. Uh, and uh, Edward's very well known in the science fiction community. Farah Mendelssohn was, um, is, uh, uh, I met through Edward as well. Um, uh, there was the Czech academic Darko Suvin and, oh, what was his other, there's a HG Wells scholar, um, Patrick Parinder was the other guy there. And there were two people on the course. There was me and a Greek chap, um, Giannis who did, uh, I mean, he was very nice. That um, Oh, so I think there was one remote studier as well. Um, but yeah, Giannis did his dissertation on Greek science fiction. Um, and I asked Edward, was it any good? He said he didn't know. He hadn't read any Greek science fiction, but they presumed they knew what Giannis was talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, so I did, what were my papers on? I did feminism and cyberpunk. I did um, spirituality and theology in the works of Arthur C. Clarke. I did post-apocalypse dystopias. And for my main dissertation, I did um, representations of the Vietnam conflict in science fiction. Um, so, yeah, all, all the fun light subjects. Yeah, yeah. Um, but SF is so such a huge field that you only just sort of in a year. I mean, I've been reading it since I was a kid, obviously. But in a year, it sort of you don't even touch the, the corner of it, really. And I thought maybe I'm going to be an academic, maybe I want to do a PhD. But after doing a year's intense masters, I was like, no, I do not want to do a PhD, um, which probably much to the delight of my parents. So <laughs> like, uh, actually, go out and get a job. So I ended up staying in Reading because I just met friends there. Um, of the gaming community, as it were, uh, I ended up living with them. So our D and D buddies, and yeah, I stayed in Reading and lived in Reading for a fair while. Um, and uh, yeah, but I I have got a master's degree in science fiction, and then it wasn't until years later that I ended up at Rebellion and, and ended up a science fiction editor. But I did, so it seems like it had a vo it, it led to a vocation almost, sort of. Right. You know. Right, yeah. And I mean, what what was the time frame between studying, getting the Masters of Science Fiction, and then starting to work at Rebellion? And oh, then right. in, in the in-between time, were there other editing gigs that you had? So I finished my Master's degree in 2000, and then I started with Rebellion in, I think it was 2005, um, so between that time, I, my first, I mean, after I graduated, I worked for book world, which is no longer a book chain, which was a bargain basement, um, remained a bookshop, which was bloody miserable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did that, did that over one Christmas at the Oracle center in Reading, which hadn't even been completed by then. Right. Um, uh, Reading fact fans. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I was main. I had long hair then as well, and just was sort of looked like a bit. Of, well, I looked like Peter Jackson, pretty right. much. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I still look a bit like. I looked like pre Lord of the Rings Peter Jackson. I am still quite chubby. Um, uh, yeah, so I worked in uh, rubbish jobs for a while, um, and then I got my first job in publishing, which was a, with a company called Gordon and Breach which was an academic publisher in Reading who were then bought by Taylor and Francis, who were owned by Routledge, one of the biggest publishers in the world. So we moved from Reading to, um, the office moved from Reading to Didcot. Um, and then so I was in academic publishing for five years doing exciting economic journals as a production editor, which give, gave me a really good grounding in sort of the mechanics of print. Um, um, but I wanted, obviously, to do something a little bit more exciting with my life. And I was looking around for jobs, and I saw a tiny ad in The Guardian, in a, in a print edition of The Guardian, no less. This is, you know, an actual newspaper. Um, yeah, people are um, going to have to reference that, like they're going to yeah. have to look up this VHS thing <laughs> I, that we spoke I, about earlier. I bought The Guardian jobs section. Now you just look online. Yeah. I, you know, um, 
but yeah, it was, uh, editor. The 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 description was something like editor wanted for a uh, new line of high action science fiction adventure stuff. And I saw that the um, email address was at 2000 AD online. And obviously, I'm a British kid of a certain age. I grew up reading 2000 AD. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know those guys were. And they're local. They're in Oxford. So I was like, yes, please. I'll have some of that. So I went for the interview. And I think I waited for something like three months to hear back whether I got the job. I was climbing the fucking wall. Um, <laughs> so it was the longest time I've had anybody get back to me. Um, but yeah, eventually I was contacted. And I think Jason Kingsley, who runs Rebellion, saw that I was really enthusiastic. I'd been going to conventions since I was uh, 17, so I was sort of part of the community anyway. Um so he employed me, bless him, and we created a bad and books together. Um, and we literally made it up as we went along. You know, I, I had grounding in production. Jason sort of vaguely knew how books were produced, but we really found out how to do it together. Uh, it was I went to um, Games Workshop to sort talk to Marcus Gascoigne, who worked there at the time, who, you know, was going to then go on to... Um, form Angry Robot and, um, you know, been in publishing a long time. So he was a sort of early mentor to me in publishing. Um, yeah, and we opened Abaddon Books. We opened the slush gates. I literally would read, you know, I wouldn't read all of everything that came in. I'd always read a bit of it. You usually know if something's not good after a few thousand words. Um, but, yeah, we had a huge slush pile and we sort of started there and so that's how I got into fiction publishing and then when I started in with Rebellion we were in uh, we were just off St. Aldate's near Christchurch uh, in quite a small office um, and in fact we were in an old printer's warehouse 2000 AD and the fiction guys uh, it was me uh, Matt Smith editor of 2000 AD who's still the editor of 2000 AD Alan Barnes was the editor of the magazine, but left shortly after I joined to go and be the script editor, I think, for Big Finish, Doctor Who stuff. Um, as Simon and Luke, the designers, and Catherine, who was um, did various things at Rebellion. She was Reaper Graphics, I think, for a while. Um, yeah, and we were literally in a shed, really. We are in an old printer's warehouse shed thing with a leaky roof. <laughs> and you know, It was the least glamorous uh, place ever. I remember a kid won a uh, competition with 2000 AD wants to come and see the office of 2000 AD. Yeah. Come see the nerve center. I'm like, holy shit. I mean, <laughs> this is going to be daunting for him. I was like, what do we do? Cover everything in tin foil and say, welcome to the future. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was really, we made everything up as we went along and I was the graphic novels editor as well. Well, uh, of 2000 AD, I turned up and they were like, do you want to edit graphic novels for 2000 AD? I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'll do that. And it was sort of just get stuck in and figure it out. And it was literally get stuck in when I started as the graphic novels editor. Um, so putting together stuff from old black and white film um, as that was produced back in, as how the comic was produced back in the day. And I said, I need to put together Judge Dredd case files one, where's the archive? And it's like, oh, well, we, we had a bit of an issue with the archive, as in um, part of the roof came down and flooded it, so we've chucked it all in another room. And what they meant by chucked it all in another room was they grabbed handfuls of black and white film and chucked it into a room. So to source a book, you had to literally grub around on your hands and knees, going through sheet after sheet of black and white film, going, is that Judge Dredd? No, that's Rogue Trooper. And putting into piles. <laughs> so... It was uh, it was a little bit messy. <laughs> so, yeah. And then um, 2009, Rebellion um, acquired Solaris from Games Workshop. Um, I'd just seen a little um, thing in the bookseller, I think, that um, uh, Games Workshop were looking to sell Solaris. And I just said to Jason, that's interesting because we both knew Marcus and... You know, it's just sort of interesting news, not thinking anything of it, really. And then a few weeks later, he said, oh, I've just bought Solaris. You're in charge. Go up to Games Workshop and find out about it. So I went up to Nottingham for a few days to sort of take take it over and speak to the team there, George Mann and um, 
Darius Hinks was there, I think, and um, oh, what's his name? Oh, um, Mark Newton as well. So I spoke to those guys, and yeah, I became editor of Solaris, and that was um, whereas the Baden Books was a um, work for hire imprint. Solaris was much more traditional author led imprint, and I we and with that imprint came some names I I recognised immediately like james lovegrove for example and brian lumley and so it's like oh there's you know these people i've read a lot of so it was really fun to um be able to take on already established and really exciting imprint and do more with it so that's how that's what i did and then um after taking over solaris and doing a badden it, it became clear that my job load was quite big, so I gave up the graphic novels editing, and and, and Keith Richardson took that over. Uh, it is still in his capable hands. Um, yeah, so that's where we went, and uh, we tried all sorts of mad things over. I was with Rebellion for 13 years almost, I think, so it's a long time, and uh, produced hundreds of books. So that is my career, really, so far. Yeah, and I think maybe some of the things that people will be most familiar with uh, some of the anthologies that you put together. So, I mean, how did they come about? And at what point did you decide you were going to put out an anthology? Was that another case of you fancied it? You mentioned it to Jason and he said, <laughs> yeah, all right then. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, pretty much. I've always I've always loved short stories, always, lo um, you know, grew up reading Into Zone and um, uh, The Third Alternative, which was to become Black Static and small press magazines like that and anthologies and short stories were the real, especially as a horror fan, they're the real lifeblood of horror. Um, so I'd always wanted to do an anthology. So um, when we got Solaris, it was one of the things I definitely, you know, one of the first things I wanted to do was, and Solaris had done anthologies before. They did um, science fiction and fantasy anthologies, um, but there weren't any horror ones, I don't. No, there was one Ellen Datlow one. There was a Poe one that Ellen did for them. Um, but I wanted to do my own. So, uh, yeah, I started to pull together a list of, people i wanted to target for the first anthology and i think pretty much all of them said yes so yeah end of the line was the first one and uh, i just loved doing it really good fun um doing it and i did uh how many anthologies did i do some i think it's about five um they're in a bookcase in the other room i can be it <laughs> yeah yeah i i would i would have guessed at five or six but <laughs> i would have hoped you might have known <laughs> but I never one, mind <laughs> i did one not for solaris i did one for cubicle seven who are also owned by rebellion a game company yeah yeah and we did world war cthulhu with them um which was much more kind of very much more traditional hp lovecraft stuff um and very much of a sort of the gaming element but that was fun to do as well so yeah i did and um, did a bunch of anthologies and one um collection of novellas um but it was really good and you just get to work with your favorite writers basically you sort of and discover newer ones and just yeah it's a it's not a joy to do them um mm. loved it and so now you work for lion hudson who yeah. Who produce, according to the tagline, quality literature true to the Christian faith. True so that. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering, why did you leave Rebellion, and why did you start working for Lion Hudson? <laughs> um, a nervous laugh. Uh, yeah. I mean, it is. A, it's, it is a. Uh, it seems a bit of a sideways move. Absolutely. Um. I, I say, say it was with Rebellion for 13 years, um, and it, I just felt that I wasn't, I, w I wasn't you know, kind of moving anywhere after a while. Um, so rather than me get stagnant or anything, I'd rather have, you know, I, I felt that I'd wanted to move on and sort of give them a chance to refresh and think doing new things and things like that and they have they seem to be doing well which is great um and i wanted to stay in books um 
and the job at Lion came up. In fact, my colleague at um, uh, Solaris, uh, Remy, used to work for Lion, and I saw that they had the position come up for a senior commissioning editor. And again, Lion, a local, um, which I've managed to work in Oxford, and it's Anvarans throughout my entire publishing career, which is grand because uh, I live here. Um, and uh, yeah, so Remy said they were good people to work with. I've, I've, as I say, I've grown up in the church. I am a practicing Christian, so it felt like a I could publish books. Been doing that for a long time. B I understood Christianity, um, although when I started a line and realized how many demo- there might be way more denominations than I imagined there were, that <laughs> understanding Christianity is actually quite difficult. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it was wanting to try something a bit different for a while to see how that went. And, yeah, so I moved sideways. And, yeah, a lot of people are surprised to find a former sort of horror editor at their Christian conference um, talking to them sometimes but most people are fairly accepting of it and uh, and I do find theology interesting um, so it's, it's sort of the commissioning process and finding good books is the same regardless of what the book's about really good writing is good writing so you apply the same principles you're just working in a different sort of field working in a different genre so to speak um, but yeah, I do two imprints there, and uh, it is a very different working environment. It is, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, something to add to the CV. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and was was your undergraduate in theology, or have I just made that up? No, I did. I did an English degree and then a Master's of Science Fiction degree. Okay, so I have just made that up for you. <laughs> no, any th- any theological grounding is through my father. My right. Sister. Okay. Yeah. My sister is a theologian, and she works for the Diocese of Canterbury and is in the process of looking into ordination. Um, so, yeah, my my sister is very much, uh, she works for the Archbishop of Canterbury, so she's very wow. engaged in the church. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, but as in terms of, like, going into the family business, uh, I'd managed to avoid it <laughs> for a long time. Now I sort of, I guess I am sort of in the family business, so to speak. But, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's 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 an interesting world, and publishing's you know there's always different challenges. I'm just gonna have to let the cat out the room. That's okay. She's decided yeah. she's had enough. She's an atheist. She doesn't like this bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, there she goes. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so so that's what that's what I did. But I do keep my hand in in fiction. You know, I'm constantly reading it. I'm writing it. I'm still, you know. Uh, I still feel, I hope I feel part of the community and, you know, I'm going to Fantasy Con this year, but I have to bloody pay for it this time. I don't get to go to conventions for free anymore. Yeah, yeah. Outrageous. Yeah. Um, I should have some sort of lifetime membership, really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if they valued me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, maybe I will return to fiction one day. I don't know. At the moment, I'm doing this. Um and it's interesting. I, I would say that the senior roles in fiction editing are incredibly hard to get uh, because most people who end up in senior roles in editing fiction don't tend to move anywhere. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I don't know what, what the future holds in terms of, I mean, there's my own writing. I would like to do, I, I have been talking with another quite well-known editor about the possibility of doing an anthology but this is very early days sort of you know thumb in the wind kind of idea so we'll see but hopefully yeah definitely return to it at some point yeah and i wonder in stepping away from genre publishing for your monday to friday job has that in a way renewed your love for genre fiction or made you yeah i think when it's not your job anymore i suppose you you maybe appreciate it a bit more when you're doing it um you know sort of uh yeah i mean one yeah uh, sorry i got all muddled now um yeah absolutely it's i certainly um when it when it's your job and it's also your hobby I, i guess it does feel sometimes you 
you are a bit too involved, I suppose. You can get a bit too close. Things can wound a bit more. Um, but when you're in doing a job that this job is much more, uh, I mean, it's intense and it requires a lot of knowledge and it requires a lot of expertise. But it is a, it's not a job I... Uh, once I'm out the office, I am out the office. I, you know, I put a lot of work into what I do, but in my downtime, I enjoy what I enjoy, you know, reading or playing games or whatever. So, yeah, it's being slightly less. It's not so much of my free time as well now. So yeah, yeah. And you said earlier about the new short story collection you have coming yeah. out. So that's the language of beasts from the language of beasts, yeah, yeah. from Cheesine. So, yeah. which is great. I love Cheesine. So I was really pleased to place it with them. Um, I've known Brett and Sandra for quite a while from just you know going to conventions, and they published Helen Marshall's first book. They've yeah. published paul trembler you know they've published some brilliant people um so uh, yeah it's really exciting and it's really good to have a kind of collection of short stories that that's a that's kind of life goal you know i've always wanted to have a collection out and this collection is you know as i say it's it's the, uh, the stuff i'm producing now i feel really pleased with ask me again in 10 years time but you know at the moment i'm really happy with the contents of that and most of it's been published in other anthologies as well right and how did the collection actually come about i mean was it a case of having a conversation with them to see if they were interested in a collection or did you specifically order a load of stories and pitch it that way yeah sort of the latter um it, it went to a ver variety of people um all of whom are very nice about it, but, you know, um, they turned it down before Cheesine took it. So, you know, I spoke to George Sanderson saw it, who's um, a really good friend, Michael Kelly's seen it, and they've all been very complimentary, but it's not been quite a good fit for them at the time. But Cheesine, yeah, Brett, Brett read the title story and a few more. I said, yeah, this is really good. So we'll take it. And obviously I knew cheesing really well. So I was like, no, I'm delighted to have the mm. home there. Yeah. And I mean, the advantage of working in publishing in genre publishing is I know a lot of people. So I was able to put the stories together and send it around writer buddies to say, if you like this, would you say something nice? So it comes with like 20 odd endorsements at the right, beginning from right. quite well known writers and the introductions by Sarah Lott. So it, I think as a sort of package to send to a publisher, it's got lots of endorsements and it's got an intro by a really good horror writer. So, you know, it's sort of, it comes with a stamp of approval, so to speak. Uh, I mean, hopefully people would like it, but yeah. So, you know, I've, uh, it's, uh, I, I th it's a good home for it there. And uh, I'm delighted they've taken it on. So that's really encouraging. So, yeah. So you got the introduction and the endorsements done before you mm. sent it to Cheesine? On the whole, uh, uh, yeah. So I was getting some in, um, collected over a period of time, the endorsements. So, mm. yeah. And, you know, writing buddies like Rob Sherman and Tom Lloyd have been really encouraging and sort of uh, just something I'd always wanted to do and people were telling me that the stories were good enough. So I thought, why not try and get a short story collection out then and yeah, eventually succeed. So that's great. I'm very happy with that. Yeah. And getting the quotes together. I mean, that sounds like a good tip for anyone who can do that because I yeah, mean, you're I also going to, yeah, go on. Use the people, you know, if you're part of a community and, some of those people in that community are, you know, more established than others or whatever, then you can use people. There's no shame in that, absolutely. And we all support each other as writers. You know, when a buddy has a book out, <clears throat> I'm well aware that I could probably drop a line to the publicist at any of the genre publishers say, hey, it's John, remember me, send me a free book. But generally, I like to buy books, to, you know, uh, my buddies do. So we all support each other and... Um, you know, I think it all goes round, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. What can you tell us about the content of the collection and perhaps some of the thematic concerns? 
Uh, it's yeah, so it's mainly horror and weird. There is a couple of science fiction stories in there as well. Um, the title story, The Language of Beasts, was actually written for an anthology that I don't think happened. Though, so though someone was putting, I think it might have been Simon Bestwick or somebody. I can't remember now. It's a while ago, but they were putting together an anthology in tribute to Joel Lane. Um, so I wrote a story sort of full of grim, dark humour, because that's sort of thing Joel liked. Um, and, yeah, The Language of Beasts, the title story, is set in a slaughterhouse, and it's about um, slaughtermen, one particular, who, while he's eviscerating a cow at this food processing plant, realises that when he opens up a cow and looks at its guts on the floor, he can sort of read futures in it. He can, like, small futures, like, um, you know, he can play get racehorse names and stuff like that right. so it's, that's the start that's the hook so to speak of the story and then it's how he uses his knowledge and how he um follows that sort of particularly it's a very grim path i think <clears throat> mainly if i'm going to sound up my own ass it's about to toxic masculinity but, <laughs> but that does sound very pretentious right um but yeah, there's a couple of vicar stories in there as well. There's a story about a woman priest who gets possessed by an elderly conservative priest. Um, sort of sort of a dark comedy horror version of um, what's that Steve Martin film called? Uh, ah, bit where he gets possessed by Lily Tomlin. Uh, it'll come back to me. Um, all of me, that's it. Yeah. Uh, there's another vicar story about a vicar, uh, a nice liberal Anglican priest who finds himself um, called uh, to the last battle between heaven and hell. Um, that was written for uh, Jared Sheeran and um, Anne Perry, actually. Uh, <clears throat> there's a couple of stories set in the fictional western town of Pandemonium, um, one of which was published in the Pandemonium anthology. Um, uh, there was a shared world anthology of Western stories and there was going to be a follow-up volume set in the 1920s, but that never made it out. But I did write a story set in Pandemonium in like the mid 19th century and the 1920s, both of which are sort of weird horror stories. Um, but yeah, I think the tone is generally horror. -y. Uh, I think there's a fair amount of dark humor in it. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's quite a nice ver variety of tales from the quiet. There's some quiet kind of folk fantasy horror and there's some bigger brasher sort of <clears throat> more unpleasant horror. Um, so all sorts, really. It's a nice smorgasbord. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. And I'm particularly intrigued mm -hmm. by the title story with the slaughterhouse. And yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it was either going to... Uh, I was torn between two titles. I was either going to use... Um, um, oh, and now my brain dies. Um, some, oh, God. There's a line from a Cowboy Junkie song that I really love and I've completely forgotten. Um, oh, Dead Men Making Trouble was going to be the other title because there's a line in a Cowboy Junkie song that is, Memories are just dead men making trouble which I really liked. But then I thought, actually, The Language of Beasts itself is a quite a evocative title for a collection of sh short stories. So I went with that. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it certainly seems to fit Cheezine as well. I mean, oddly yeah, enough, yeah. The Language of Beasts totally sounds like something they would put out. And <laughs> yeah. in, indeed, here mm -hmm. it is. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about the cover art i mean i don't think there's been a reveal yet but it's not is... yet i presuming i may be wrong but i'm presuming it'll be by eric moore who does most of their covers and i used eric for a couple of solaris books i used him for um signal to noise by sylvia moreno garcia and cannon bridge by jonathan barnes and he's a cracking cover artist so if he is doing the cover i couldn't be more delighted with their choice of artist so i'm looking forward to that yeah. Do you have any direction or is there anything? No, you... no, they haven't asked. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I trust them in their covers. I mean, their covers are gorgeous. So they are, yeah. the fact that they haven't asked for direction is fine with me. If it maybe was a different publisher whose covers I wasn't so confident in, maybe I'd have suggested something. I mean, when I was 
putting it together, I did wonder about um, my old colleague Simon Parr doing a cover because he's really good. Mm. Um, and I love Pi, uh, which he's also known as, yeah. um, to do. Uh, he's done covers for you. Um, he has, yeah. I'd yeah. love him to do a cover for me because he is brilliant. And hopefully at one point he will. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure at some point there'll be, you know, maybe even this novella that I'm writing. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, there are, there are artists that I've worked with in the past, uh, who I'd love to illustrate my stuff. Nicholas Delore would be another one who did, um, uh, the cover for magic and end of the road and dangerous games is brilliant artist. So yeah, he's quite expensive though. And I don't have a spare grand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so when it becomes your own money it's a bit different <laughs> right yeah yeah and i i mean the thing is that as good as he is you can get a very professional cover for half the price if not even less than that so yeah i mean yeah i i think it's important when you get it's important to invest in good art when where you can yeah, yeah. Um, that's the thing about learning how to make a book if you're going down the sort of self-publishing small press route isn't it it's like, like uh, the end product is very important so you've got to invest in um decent art and typesetting absolutely yeah and i mean ha having said what i just did if the absolute perfect cover for my book was a grand then you know, I I dropped a grand on it. I mean, I, I yeah, don't, don't know yeah. if I'd be optimistic. I'd make much money <laughs> back from <laughs> it, but I mean, I I always like to put the story first, and you have to put the art first. And I mean, you were saying and you I, yeah. you were sounding pretentious earlier. I'm probably sounding really pretentious <laughs> now. Well, a good looking book's going to have longevity as well. Yeah. A, 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 a beautiful product is something you're going to admire for a while whereas if you're you know you god bless and there are some small presses who put out these books that their contents may be great but they look awful yeah uh, it's not necessarily something you'll you know they won't have the same longevity um so but yeah it's it's it is hard to make books good yeah yeah well i mean i think the cover it is your calling card it is the first yeah. thing that people see and I mean, particularly, you said that you don't write at quite a prolific rate, so you want to make sure that if you don't have that many books on the shelf that are your own, that you want each one to count. You don't want it to be something that you tuck away and try and hide. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But how important did you find ordering the collection? Was that something that you spent a lot of time on? and? Mm. For those putting together a short story collection, do you have any tips for that? I think it's sort of um, it's the same with putting together anthologies. You usually you lead with what you think is your one of the strongest stories. You put one of the stronger ones in the middle and end on a really strong one. That's not to say all the rest of the stories aren't good. Obviously they are. You wouldn't include them, but yeah, it's sort of you. You want the beats to be sort of beginning, middle, and an end, and um, the stuff in between is uh, sort of um, as important to lead up to those beats. But uh, so yeah, I can't. It's, it's been actually quite a long time since I put it together and getting it out there. I, I can't remember much about how I did it. I, re I remember I definitely lead on one of my favourite stories that I wrote for. Um, uh, well, I didn't write it for Alchemy. Well, I wrote it on spec and sent it to Alchemy Press, and they published it in the Book of Urban Mythic. And that's a story called White Horse, which is a really sort of a, it's kind of a folk folk fantasy stroke horror. And that that felt that story always feels quite close because it's sort of about somebody healing from um, depression and sort of dealing with depression through creativity, and in this case, magic. Um, so yeah, I, I, I was, I've always been really proud of that story. So that was, that was front and center. Um, I think I end on language of beasts. I'll have to look at the manuscript. I've looked at it in ages. So I can't remember what the middle story is now. It might be one of the pandemonium tales. Um, but yeah, you sort of get, you get a, a same with an anthology. You sort of get a natural rhythm that sort of falls into place once you put the stories in the right order. 
and um, that's going to be the same for single author collections as well as multi-author collections so that's how you do it and i so i learned how to do it from doing anthologies really yeah yeah well i mean what are you working on now is it exclusively the novella that you mentioned earlier or do you have yeah. any other projects so in the pipeline well, we've got other irons in the fire um so we've got this ya thing that i've i've written with uh, uh, another author um and you know if that got picked up that would be really good fun because we've had really good fun kind of creating it um and i think it's i i think kids will like it it's kind of kid i was going to say it's kid friendly horror it's got it's actually quite grim it's got an evil chimney sweep in it which was great fun to write and uh, so we've got <laughs> kids getting stuffed up chimneys um uh which is really unpleasant but <laughs> yeah <laughs> But it's kind of a good sort of an adventure story. Um, I've got a um, part of a Kickstarter that's coming from Beyond Death Publishing, which is called um, um, uh, Love Beyond Death. Uh, it's a dark uh, dark affection anthology. So there's sort of love, dark love stories. Um, and that's Dick and Springgate's Beyond Death Publishing. So check out the Kickstarter. Do back us if you can. Um, Dickon is a new publisher. He published a story of mine last year in Cthulhu 1816, The Year Without Summer, which was a uh, uh, Lovecraftian, very specifically Cthulhu mythos tale set in The Year Without Summer, which is the year where um, Krakatoa, I think it's Krakatoa, as Vesuvius was earlier, Krakatoa had exploded, so the weather patterns were changed that year. So it was all very uh, wintry across the world. It was also, you know, um, Napoleonic era. So there were things going on. So I wrote a story for that called Turner's Apprentice about the artist J.W. Turner being wooed by a cultist. Um, so, yeah, I'm doing another story for Dick and my story is called Nocturne, which is in the Love Beyond Death anthology. And Nocturne is, again, it's a it's a sort of pastoral, um, dark fantasy. It's about spiders, ghosts and love. Uh, I'm really pleased with it. It's called Nocturne. I wrote it entirely on spec. Uh, I think it's lovely and quite dark. Um, so, yeah, and I'm just working on this novella at the moment, which who knows where that will end up or whether it will end up anywhere. Um, I've taken a pause on it to reread what i've gone over so far and sort of restructure it to get it kick-started again um so yeah i i mean there are novella publishers out there i could send it to um and i forgot anything else on the go that's it at the moment but i'm always open to reasonable commissions <laughs> yeah so people <laughs> I quite are like listening writing, <laughs> yeah I, I do like writing short stories and like being asked to write short stories because um, writing on spec you're always writing completely in the dark as it were yeah um, yeah so yeah that's what i've got on the go in in the moments where i've got free time which is a guy with a full-time job and two daughters is not often so. right yeah yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's that's really what I'm working on now. And as I say, there's this sort of, there may be an anthology idea floating in the wind that may turn into something, but we'll see about that. Yeah. No, I'd ask more about it, but it's fairly evident that you can't say any more yeah, right now. Yeah, I don't want to say anything because, I, yeah, it is a well-known editor, so I, I, I'm aware he's got eight billion things on at the moment. And I don't want to sort of say, yeah, definitely going to do that. And then screw his timeline up for the next two years. So. Yeah. Yeah, he yeah. Pro probably wouldn't approve if I sent him the episode and said, here it is, it's on record. So when is it coming <laughs> yeah. out? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so just, you know, keeping my hand in. So I'm going to be at Fancy Con this year purely as a punter. Um, see buddies, I haven't put myself forward for any panels because... As fun as panels are, I've done that for the last 13 years or so. So I'm just going to hang out yeah. a bit this time and see see old friends. And I still, you know, when I'm up in London, I still keep in touch with um, genre buddies, especially through social media. But still get together with for the odd pint with, you know, people like Rob Sherman, mm. and Lydia, who works at Titan, and um, Sarah Lotz, obviously. And, uh, yeah, so, yeah, still part, still here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'll yeah. probably be a 
a great and refreshing experience being at fantasy con and it's just like i can socialize and i can drink beer yeah. and i don't have to work <laughs> nobody will be trying to pitch me anything so yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, if they do that's going to be very surprising <laughs> oh, i don't know maybe someone's listening who's got a Actually, great you know christian what? story I... that they want to throw I was, your way i was pitched some non-fiction by um a I see with Solaris or Abaddon, it was one of da one of David's authors, and it, it it was it was pretty decent. It wasn't quite right for us, but that that author is doing well with Solaris and Abaddon at the moment. So it does happen, and you know. So and uh, one of my other Simon Morden, who I'm friends with on um, social media, um, recommended a friend of his for us at Lion. So yeah, there there are links even across the genre and non fiction community. So Right, yeah. 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 Well we've got a question from SM Fedor via Patreon. And cool. he says, Do you have any techniques for quickly resetting the mind and eyes when doing an edit? I often have to shelf a story for days or weeks before doing the final edits to catch all the issues I missed the previous many read-throughs, but deadlines don't always allow for that sit-and-bake yeah. style. You're always going to... If you if you are editing your own things, um, and you, obviously you, you, you polish it as much as possible before you send it off, you're never going to catch anything. Somebody's always going to catch something. Um, yeah, editing yourself is... You're, you definitely polish your manuscript as much before you send it off. I remember Scott Andrews, who uh, did several novels for me and Baden, said, always aim to send a manuscript you'd be happy to see in print the very next day. Um, obviously, things go through edits, and they should, but uh, produce the best so you can. I think taking a couple of days off it, if you've been reading it endlessly uh, for a while, is a good idea read something else because it can you can come a bit fresher that way i mean as i say you're not going to catch everything i remember uh i wrote the pandemonium story i wrote for Anne perry um and this was a shared world anthology so we all had to make sure that our stories didn't cross over you know change anything fundamentally about the other stories we had to work to a timeline and and said, oh, um, the, there was some dates on a tombstone at the end. And she said, oh, that doesn't work with the timeline. And me being, like most authors, fairly capable of prima donna type behavior, said, oh, in that case, you can just reject the story. That's fine. She said, yeah, or, or you could change the date. I was like, yeah, or I could change the date. That's <laughs> 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 um, so you're never going to spot everything. And that's why there are editors around um to help you uh so yeah um if you want to if you need some fresher eyes on it just go and do something else for a few days write something else read something else that's the best way right yeah mm -hmm. i do like the tip to not send anything out that you wouldn't theoretically be okay having in print the next day yeah, yeah. because Absolutely. i mean that there's some writers and of course i won't name anyone who have said that they'll almost send something that they know is a little bit rough around the edges because the editor will then point out what the issue is. But, I mean, <laughs> may maybe I just don't trust people as much, but I would never assume that the editor will spot absolutely everything, so I yeah, need yeah. to be happy with it. And, of course, the yeah. best editors will make it even better, but, yeah, I mean, don't leave things to chance if you know something is wrong then i mean you're gonna be right there is something wrong <laughs> now it's your job to figure yeah. out what it is yeah and i'm um i was gonna say uh, as yeah good editors are needed and a good editor will make the story better um i had i did have one fairly well-known horror author one sign a contract and write in biro on the contract uh, my story's not to be edited <laughs> on submission, which I ignored and edited the story anyway, yeah, and he was fine with it. That's, that's <laughs> bizarre. I mean, that there was actually an author 
who we were going to publish a chat book by and then he said the same thing and i said well i don't publish stories that aren't edited so that was that yeah, yeah fair enough yeah absolutely i just think that's funny that you could do i don't know the whole not sending it polished and hoping that the editor will catch it you know to me that would be like the extreme i'm not gonna put the ending in let's see if they can figure it out <laughs> <laughs> No way I can figure out how I'm going to end it. Yeah. yeah. Well, help. Uh, even yeah. give you a co a co a co author, you know, tag. <laughs> yeah. it's like, why would you do that? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I rejected your story because it didn't have an ending. Well, that was your job. You know, <laughs> I was hoping, but you know, well, maybe we didn't communicate properly. <laughs> well, I mean, to finish off, I've got, a number of potentially quick fire questions. I mean, okay, they don't, cool. they don't need to have quick fire answers. But sure. Sure. I wonder what advice would you give to your 18 year old self? Oh, uh, um, stop smoking. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. That's bad for you. <laughs> um, what advice would I give to my 18 year old self? Write more. I wish I'd written more. <laughs> Keep at it, you know. Um, have confidence in yourself, that sort of thing. It's not all terrifyingly scary and awful growing up, although a lot of it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you think your 18-year-old self would have listened to you or would... He oh, won he wonder well, why is this guy coming up to me? I, well I always <laughs> had I always had um friends who were a fair bit older than me growing up, so I think I respected adults more than yeah. I respected my own peers, so maybe. Yeah. All right. And what do you hope that people say about you when you're not in the room? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's the best editor ever. Yeah, uh, yeah that's a good one. <laughs> Definitely better than Stephen Jones. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I know Stephen would not like that. I'm joking, Stephen, if you're listening. Um, uh, what to say? He's a really nice guy to work with and not clearly passionate about what he does, I suppose. I, I, I imagine that's probably, they say all sorts of terrible things instead, but there you go. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and what is something that you believe that many of us do not. <laughs> you asked that of a Christian. <laughs> well, I did. I, I, I thought when I said that, though, I thought there are a lot of people that are Christian, so I, d I don't think something yeah, of Christianity what do I can be. That many people do not. I don't, I, oh, uh, you know, I don't know. That's a really interesting question. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I believe. I used to believe a lot of things about films that turned out to be wrong, like The Keep and Nomads being good. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. That's a really interesting question. Um, I still think, you know, a lot of people say print is dead, but they've been saying that ever since I started in books and almost ever since I've been reading books. So I think, you know, have courage. People still want the book. Books will still be around as physical things. Um, they're not going away anyway, anywhere soon. So that's what I'd say. Yeah. I mean, I think print can decline and it can be cyclical, cool. but I think the idea that one day it will just die. It, it's very difficult to imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Everything is cyclic. I mean, yeah. it's just, you know, they say that print is still killing ebooks. So, you know, and e but ebooks are mm. still on the rise. Mm -mm. You know, the, the actual physical book isn't going anywhere. No, not quite. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is a cheery question to, <laughs> to round things <laughs> off, but what frightens you? Oh, where do you start? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, just sort of the worst bits of humanity, like everybody, I suppose, cruelty and sort of um, ignorance and, you know, that frightens me. Um, you know, I, 
I mean, if you t- if you're talking in terms of sort of what gets to me in horror and what sort of works on me in horror, a good ghost story will still work on me. But a good ghost story has to be also a really good human story. So it can't just be about things that go bump in the night and go boo. There have to be, like we we're talking about with the haunting of Hill House earlier, there ha- it has to be wrapped mm-hmm. up into a human drama to be really scary. Um, mm-hmm. One of the films that really got to me. I don't know whether it sort of it didn't scare me in a way of making me jump, but it really got under my skin was um, a dark song. The oh, thing yeah. about yeah, yeah, oh, I love that. Man. Fantastic, really, mm-hmm. kind of you know sends shivers up. and that sort of in terms of like spiritual occult horror. Not a lot of it works, but when it works, it it can be really sort of insidious and scary. And I thought that one had some really interesting things to say about like sort of human perceptions of hell and salvation and mm-hmm. all sorts of stuff was going on in that film. And Steve Oram as the uh, cultist was just astonishingly good. Yeah. Um, so that sort of stuff get that still works. And the bits of the haunting of Hill House, the new series, really worked on me. Um, in terms of what scares you as a sort of human being, it's, it must be the same of every for everybody. If you're a parent, it's the idea of your kids being seriously ill or being hurt. I mean, that's terrifying. All all parents are, are terrified of that. And you know, in terms of sort of general day to day things, you look at the news and how fabulously everything going, and that can be overwhelmingly scary. But also you sort of have to step back and realize you don't actually, you're not in charge of the world. Um, so you've got to sort of take things from a distance sometimes. Um, but I think just fear, fears are common, you know, that's why horror works. That's what, because we're all scared fundamentally of the same things. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I think in terms of the news, I don't know if this is something you do too, but I find if you read it, too much i mean it can really make you quite depressed and i think as human beings we're not meant to be consuming that amount of tragedy and that amount that's that's, that's the problem with social media you you can just spend all day on it going oh things are getting worse and worse and worse and all you're doing is staring at your laptop and ignoring the perfectly fine life that's going on around you that you should probably be a part of you know it can it's about perspectives really and that's why you know when i'm on holiday i turn off social media in the news for two weeks yeah. and it's i love it yeah <laughs> so, yeah mm-hmm. of course i'm obs- obsessively back on it as soon yeah. as i'm back <laughs> unfortunately but... so yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely and i mean that there's a an awareness that social media isn't great for mental health and i think it's more not, and more no. people are taking social media breaks but i do think people should in some sense take media breaks take breaks yeah. from the news yeah. and yeah you know, we're not saying to know nothing of what's going on but yeah, you don't absolutely. really have to check in multiple no. times every single day no. i mean no you- exactly i remember when 9 11 happened which was obviously horrific and world changing we were living with an american at the time in our shared house and we just watched the news again and again and again and it's like how many times have I now seen the planes hitting the building? How many times have I seen mm-hmm. that guy jumping out of the window? It's just, it's horrific, but there is no point in just pounding this image into my brain again and again and again. I realize how bad this is, but also if if it just fills you with hopelessness and despair, it cripples you, and there, then there's no point, you know, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, misery loves company, and, and, and you will... You can become addicted to it because, I mean, yeah. you know, I remember uh, when 9-11 happened, uh, I was in a job that requires, you know, customers to actually come to the business and yeah. there were no customers. So we sat in a room and watched TV uh, and watched the news. And after about, uh, I'd say probably about two two weeks of this, you know, it was kind of like, you know, we just couldn't t- take it. It was just, yeah, you know, exactly. It's it yeah. so much. Yeah. And, uh, you have to, you have to step away from that. You have to detox. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah. And I mean, if you do find that, I guess you're getting consumed by the negativity of the news, are there other things that you do to try and like step yeah. away and to reset? I mean, you, uh- Go on. 
hang out with buddies. I mean, you've got friends. Everybody's got friends. You know, talk to a friend. Go for, go for a pint. Go do something that doesn't involve you just consuming media. Go hang out with the people in your life, your loved ones, etc. Those are, you know, that's what keeps you sane. Yeah. And, it, and these kind of things, I mean... They sound obvious, but they are things that need to be stated because it is yeah. very easy to fall into that trap. Oh, yeah. It's all about this self-care, as they call it. It's right. just learning about how important that is, and it is. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, since you mentioned it earlier, you said you're a gamer and you like to wind down with the PlayStation. So yeah. what are some of the games that you're playing at the moment? I've been playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey for what feels like months now. I still enjoy it, but I've, I looked at how many hours I put into it, and it's almost 100, which is several wow. days. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I would, I'm, usually, I'm quite a casual gamer. I don't sort of sink hours and hours into it. I usually play games over a long period of time. Um, I, with the payment from my first novel when I wrote a couple for a bad and I bought an Xbox so I can play Fallout 3 so I'm a big fan of the Fallout games um, and just some of the narratives in uh, modern games are so good I mean I talked about how I sort of abandoned games back in the day but they're, they're so much more narratively rich now so something like my favourite games are uh, the Portal games, Portal one and two a brilliant mm. portal two mm -hmm. has the greatest one of the greatest sort of um reversals in fiction that i've ever seen it was a bit at the end of portal two where something is revealed and you're like no way that <laughs> it's, it's so clever i love that game and just all of you know the narrative of it and also um bioshock i love those games just for the mm. really immersive sort of mm. dark underwater world um and Assassin's Creed Odyssey is fun. It is essentially just killing people in classical Greece. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm not entirely sure what the plot is. Um, uh, and I loved some. I loved some of the sort of more um, weird indie games. So I really, really loved um, Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, um, even though that's described not as a game but as a walking simulator. You sort of explore a story. Um, I just thought that was astonishingly beautiful. Um, and there's one called Firewatch, which is a similar type of thing. Um, I don't know what I'm anticipating. There's a new Doom game coming, I gather, and I quite enjoyed the other Doom game. Um, yeah, and, and me and my buddies get together. We do RPGs and board games. We're sort of between RPGs at the moment, but we enjoyed uh, Warhammer's Black Fortress board game very much. Um, and I think I'm going to be running some Call of Cthulhu, which I haven't done for years um, soon for them. So, yeah, and been playing that sort of thing since um, I did my Masters. So, yeah, that's what I do to have fun. That and drink heavily. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the beauty is that you can combine both activities. I mean, you oh, generally yeah. become less yeah. good at the game, but... <laughs> You know? Yeah, you might enjoy it more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. Yeah, I guess it depends what you're playing. I mean, you probably wouldn't want to drink heavily and play Alien Isolation because that oh, is like, bloody hard <laughs> enough <laughs> on its own. <laughs> that, that game, as I re rechristened it, let's hide in a cupboard for half an hour. Yeah. I, yeah. Was, playing it, I was playing it, my wife came into the room and said, what are you doing? I was like, I'm in a cupboard. Yeah. Like, yeah. Is that fun? I'm like, no, it's it's it's, re it's really traumatic. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, that was Outlast. a really good game. That was a really good game. And actually, that, that I mean, the hiding in cupboards bit of that game was quite a lot of it to its detriment. But once you get the sort of the money shots of the alien stuff that you love, once mm. the narrative develops a bit, it's actually really good. So yeah, and Dad Abnett wrote the script for that. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Worked with before. Yeah, that's a bit of trivia that I did not yeah. know. Um, yeah, and... but. Properly terrifying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh yeah, definitely. But I mean, it must be one of, if not the hardest horror games out there. Yeah, I suppose so. I gave up on um, uh, Evil Something is in the title. I think is it's it Japanese. The Evil but... Within? Or... Yeah, yeah. I just, it got too bloody hard um, and it got too bleak as well, which is weird because I like bleak stuff, but. I was like, oh, this is just grinding me. It's just depressing, wandering around 
horrible hospitals. <laughs> I'm like, I'm mm. not sure this is fun anymore. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I don't I, think they're much of the grind as the Dead Souls or, you know, games. Those are. I, no, I tried one for half a day and my friend yeah. said, yeah, but you have to like put hours into it and then you'll realize it's the best thing ever. I'm like, I no life's too short. This game can do one. I'm not playing this. <laughs> you know, everybody, they always say you have to get good. And I'm like, and it gives you a lot of opportunities to get good. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. I have to win something for yeah, me exactly. to, you know, to enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I'm never going to be the, the best gamer in the world. No. Uh, it's not high on my goal, <laughs> yeah. You know of yeah. things. You know, a friend of mine's such a big fan of that game. She's got a tattoo of it. <laughs> wow, yeah. I mean, that's that's pretty. Yeah, my tattoo would say, "You died." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Where can our listeners connect with you? Oh, okay. So I'm John Oliver, editor on Twitter. Um, and I often get quite high profile followers because I'm John Oliver and I'll get yeah, like famous yeah. people following me for half a day and I'm like, yes, they have read my fantasy novels. I've made it. And they're like, oh no, they think I'm that John Oliver. Yeah. So I do spend an inordinate amount of time on Twitter replying to um, tweets saying, uh, sadly, I'm not that John Oliver as brilliant as he is. That's not me. Um, well, maybe uh, yeah. you can take advantage of that, like the guy who's called John Lewis, who's always telling people <laughs> that he isn't, in fact, a department store. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So at John Oliver is my Twitter handle. Um, that's pretty much all I am on social media. Facebook is just sort of, I don't know, I don't use that as much. If, if you want sort of banter and jokes, uh, yeah, Twitter. Thank you for listening to the This Is Horror podcast with Jonathan Oliver. Join us again next time when we'll be chatting with T.E. Growl. And we get into so much in that conversation. It is the first time that we've spoken to Ted in, I believe, around three years. And an important book that he put out in that time is his first novel, I Am The River. So... There's an awful lot of detail into how that came about, into the thematic concerns, and it's a fascinating conversation and one that I cannot wait to share with you. And you know what? I don't have to wait if you become a patron at www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Not only do you get early bird access to the conversation with T.E. Grau, but you get early access to every single This Is Horror podcast episode. And on top of that, we have a number of exclusive podcasts that we offer. We've got the Q&A sessions with myself and Bob Pastorella, in which every topic is on the table. So it really is a case of ask us anything, whether it's about writing or horror or life or philosophy. So it's all up for grabs at the Q and A, and then we have our writing craft podcast, Story Unboxed, in which we analyze and deconstruct various short stories and films. And indeed, recently we unboxed The Intoxicated by Shirley Jackson. So, if you want to hear how we got on with that, then the only place to do so is. Story Unboxed, the horror podcast on the craft of writing. And finally, there is the video cast on camera, off record. And this is a place where me and Bob sit back. We have a little bit of a more informal conversation. We talk about horror. We talk about our life. We talk about my forthcoming move to Japan. And quite often we talk about Resident Evil and why wouldn't we? It's a fantastic game and with the remake for Resident Evil 3 coming out in April, it is a hot topic right now. So for that, for everything, for a way to support the podcast with your wallet, it's www.patreon.com forward slash 
This is horror. Okay, before I wrap up, a quick word from our sponsors. Water for Drowning by Ray Cluley, narrated by R.J. Bailey, is the brand new audiobook from This Is Horror. Including the British fantasy award winning story Shark Shark, dive in and download Water for Drowning by Ray Cluley on Audible today at bit.ly.com forward slash water for drowning in the US and bit.ly.com forward slash water for drowning UK in the UK. Now remember a way that you can support us that is absolutely free is to leave us a review over on Apple Podcasts and we are still looking for our first review of 2020 so if you have yet to leave one we would love it if you would do so today. Now as always I would like to end with a quote And this is from Allen Ginsberg. To gain your own voice, you have to forget about having it heard. I'll see you in the next episode with T.E. Growl. But until then, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.